who will get the ball rolling. Thank you, Mr. Harris Palu, for inviting Plaster to join these webinars with you in particular. Um, and thank you also to Ms. Barbara Jemek for making this collaboration possible. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone on tonight. Um, great to see so many of us here. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we will be listening to a talk from Dr. Don Lalonde uh, for the next 45 minutes. And then we'll host a Q&A section um, after this for roughly 15 minutes. There are a lot of us on the webinar tonight with just over 440 currently and over 500 registered. So we may not have time to go through everyone's questions. So um, I advise you to post your questions on the Q&A function um, rather than the chat as we go along and as they come into your mind. And we'll be able to get through hopefully the first um, few of these questions. So um, apologies if we don't get around to your question at the end. Um, and now to introduce Don Lalonde, um, we're very honored today to be joined by Dr. Lalonde. Um, he is professor of surgery at Dalhousie University in Canada and the president of the Canadian Society for the Surgery of the Hand. He's been pioneering the technique for wallant and wide awake hand surgery throughout his career and has lots of tips and tricks to share with us tonight. So we're privileged to learn from him today. So thank you very much, Dr. Lalonde. Thank you. Uh... And please tell me when you can see my screen. Can you see it yet? Uh, not yet, Don. Yeah. Okay, just a sec, I needed to click the button. Okay, it says it's sharing. Yeah, it is now, yeah. You can see the screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, for the record, I didn't invent wide awake hand surgery. Uh, I was saying to Demetrius before we started that this has been going on uh, when I was a medical student at Queen's University. Uh, people were doing uh, flexor tendon repairs in the emergency department uh, with the lidocaine and adrenaline and no tourniquets. So I certainly didn't invent this uh, procedure, but uh, I am here tonight to talk to you about tips and tricks about how to do it safely. So um, probably the two best sources, I mean, there are papers coming out on Walland every month, but the two best sources of information that are more comprehensive are the wallant.surgery website, which is free to all surgeons and hand therapists. You just log in there. Uh, and there's all kinds of videos and papers and PowerPoint presentations and so on that are worth looking at. And the second is the Wide Awake Hand Surgery book. I don't make any money on the book. All of the profits go to the uh, Hand Association effort dedicated to promoting less unnecessary cost and unnecessary garbage in, in hand surgery. So... Um, I'm going to talk about three principles which have really helped a lot of surgeons in Canada. And the first is wide awake local anesthesia, no tourniquet, which means just adrenaline and lidocaine. And that's eliminated tourniquet and sedation for most hand surgery. The second concept is that local anesthesia shouldn't hurt today. Uh, and you can do huge areas uh, and all they feel is the first little poke and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk a little bit about evidence-based sterility, uh, which has allowed us to move hand surgery outside of the uh, main operating room for at least minor procedures, uh, not plates and screws, but things like carpal tunnels and trigger fingers for sure. Uh, we don't need main operating room sterility and we have good infection data and there's very good evidence for that. So I'm gonna start with a very simple thing, which a lot of people uh, may not uh, do in such a simple way, but the two dorsal injection block is gone uh, the way of the dodo bird with evidence. And this is the simple block, single injection in the middle of the proximal phalanx with lidocaine and epinephrine. So at the count of three, just try not to move, okay? You're going to feel three little pinches, okay? okay. One, two, three. Very good. Oh, yeah. So you maintain that pinch until the sting is all gone. There's level one evidence in humans that if you inject over 60 seconds, that it hurts less than if you inject over 10 seconds. 
And my favorite go-to here is the 30 gauge needle. And you should not inject in the sheath. That hurts like hell. I've had four intra-sheath injections. And uh, you should inject in the fat between the digital nerves. Two cc's is plenty. And this is evidence. So at the count of three. Um, to the more complicated. So uh, you can do complex flexor tendon repairs, uh, full forearm tendon transfers. The bottom left is a perilunate dislocation by Carlos de Pina from Portugal. And uh, bottom right is distal radius fracture by Amir Ahmad from Malaysia, who uh, published the first case of this. And so from the simple to the complicated, uh, you can use this technique. This is Dr. Pradeep Joshi from uh, England, who is a regional block anesthetist. That's what he does. He's a hand surgery anesthetist. And he uses Walland all the time. He has been for at least uh, three years. And so now it's part of his practice. And I want to give you his impression of this because sometimes anesthetists kind of poo-poo it, but it's usually anesthetists who've never tried it. So here's an anesthetist who's tried it and gets it. Rather than just having plan A and plan B, I'm able to have plan C and plan W, plan Y. They're extremely at high risk where they can't have a general anesthetic, they can't have a uh, regional anesthetic, and they need something which I know is going to work and it's going to be safe for them. So I think it really has help me in, in those sort of circumstances where I think, well, I can't do plan A, can't do plan B, and then have to do one. So it's, it's made a big difference to my confidence in where I can apply the one technique and use the limp anesthetic, the confidence to knowing that actually this technique really does work. Especially for high comorbidity patients. I've talked with Pradeep about this. Because you know, when we look at serious complications of hand surgery, they actually have nothing to do with the surgery. It has to do with the sedation. All nausea and vomiting, that's about sedation. Surgery doesn't make you throw up. Urinary retention, malignant hyperthermia, aspiration pneumonia, thromboembolism. I mean, these are serious problems. Uh, and all anesthetists agree that less sedation is safer than more sedation. So especially in patients with a lot of comorbidities, the safest sedation is no sedation. Take this man, for example. This guy has lung cancer. He's on oxygen, but he can't sleep at night because he's got bad carpal tunnel syndrome. And he also uh, wasn't able to open his hand. And so we did them sitting up on oxygen uh, with field sterility as all carpal tunnels are done in Canada or almost all. And uh, here he is at three weeks post-op. And for the last few months of his life, he was able to sleep at night. And you just can't be giving a guy like that sedation. We were once taught that you can't put epinephrine in the finger. And we were also taught the world is flat. We now know that epinephrine is safe in the finger. And if it really does kill fingers with, uh, with ischemia, it's extremely rare. And only in those uh, who uh, have pre-existing ischemia. And we also know that it's reversible with fentolamine. There's two series with over 4,000 consecutive cases. We published ours uh, a long time ago uh, in 2005. Not one dead finger in any of those 4,000 patients and nobody needed fentolamine. And then the Chinese published 6,000 more cases in 2017 with Jin Bo Tang, no dead fingers. And this is the Chinese version of the Wide Awake Hand Surgery book, which was uh, translated into Chinese by Jin Bo Tang in 2017. Uh, 18 hand surgeons proved that fentolamine reliably reverses um, epinephrine in the human finger. These are my hands as one of those 18 surgeons back in 2002. And we were all injected six times with lidocaine and epinephrine in the six spots that you see. 
And in my right hand, an hour after lidocaine with adrenaline, I was given phentolamine, and you can see how that skin is pinking up. And on the saline chaser side, it's not pinking up. And so uh, phentolamine does work. And now in Europe and in North America, you can get phentolamine through your dentist friends as Oroverse for only $5 a little cartridge uh, vial. And it's pure phentolamine, uh, although in the United States, it's only allowed for dentists, but that's all there is in the drug. And I have never had to use phentolamine, but I use it uh, from time to time. I used it a month ago. I did a fellow who had a subtotal table saw thumb amputation. Uh, and at the end of the case, his thumb was really white. Um, he only had one artery and a little skin bridge for a vein. And so I injected phentolamine and uh, 20 minutes later, it was all pink. And so why not just use it? And then the nurses around you won't be nervous. And it's one of those things, there's no boogeyman under your bed if you go and look for it. And so if you just use the phentolamine, you'll know you're okay. This is my own hand after one in 100,000 in my little finger, one in 10,000 in my ring finger, and uh, one in 1,000 in my long finger. I think you can see it's still there. Um, and uh, that was published in 2007, the, ex the experience of it. Um, there at, in 2013, there were 272 cases of accidental high-dose epinephrine that's one in 1,000 people who think they're allergic to bees and they inject themselves in the finger by accident and the finger goes white. And not one of those fingers uh, died. But here's another tip. Even though they don't die, if people come into your emergency room, you should get your emergency colleagues to treat them with phentolamine. Why? Two reasons, one, because it hurts like hell if you have a white finger or a white thumb for 20 hours with one in a thousand epinephrine. And two, after 20 hours of ischemia, uh, you can get axonotmesis. You get Wallerian regeneration and the axons grow back down the finger. But this is totally preventable with just a little phentolamine. So you take one to two milligrams of phentolamine and you put that in one to two milliliters of saline and you put it in wherever they accidentally stab themselves in the fingertip. So here's another tip. Don't be afraid of big volume, particularly for the orthopedic surgeons in the group. Uh, orthopedic surgeons don't use a lot of tumescent local anesthesia. Plastic surgeons do all the time for liposuction, breast surgery, abdominal surgery, face surgery. Just blow it up. It's not going to hurt anything. You're not going to get a compartment syndrome uh, because as soon as you cut, the water comes out and the pressure goes away. And it's not going to impair visibility. In fact, hydro dissection makes it easier to see. Think of this as a beer block, extravascular, but only where you need it and extremely safe because it's not intravenous. So why would you blow up a whole wrist like that? Well, maybe to do a proximal row carpectomy. This is uh, Carlos de Pina doing a proximal row carpectomy. And then he uh, does a chondral graft uh, on the capitate. And all of this is with wallet. There's no tourniquet, the patient's awake, uh, comfortable, just with this kind of a block. Now in Europe, you get uh, one in 200,000 epinephrine with your 1% lidocaine. In North America, we get one in 100,000 epinephrine. It shows you how much evidence there is in drug companies. They, and, it, and it shows you what difference it makes. It doesn't make that much difference. It just bleeds a little bit more uh, if you use one in 200,000 than if you use one in 100,000. But you can make this stuff easily. So if you just start out with plain lidocaine, a bottle of 10 cc's of 1%, you can make 1% with, like in North America, simply by taking a, an insulin syringe, taking 0 0.1 milliliters and adding that to 10 cc's. And that gives you 
one percent with one in a hundred thousand. So if you want a little better hemostasis with your one in 200 that you have in Europe, you can add your own epinephrine if you want. But one in 200 works fine. So this is a fight bite that I treated myself in the emergency department without a resident. I spent a lot of time without residents. Uh, I was in the emergency department twice this weekend. And here's the tip. When you have a fight bite and you see the area of inflammation there, don't inject in the inflammation part, inject proximal to the inflammation. So I inject 10 cc's in the palm and 40 cc's on the dorsal. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So 10 cc's in the palm, don't even move the needle, draw the area of inflammation and then inject outside the area of inflammation. And the visibility is great. So I debride these in the emergency department, uh, irrigate them with tap water and betadine. I haven't taken these patients to the operating room for many years. Why would you take pus to the main operating room? It drives me crazy. But we admitted them to the hospital and there he was the next morning, all the swellings down because he's totally educated because I told him I wanted him to keep his hand up all night. And there he is a month later, and he's just fine as they have been for years uh, in our place. So here's another tip. 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000 epinephrine is extremely safe. Just don't go over that. I never go over 50 milliliters. That's my go-to. And if I need more volume, I just add saline. So that's seven milligrams per kilogram. Now the plastic surgery literature has three papers, one is dermatology, showing 35 milligrams per kilogram with liposuction, showing safe blood levels of lidocaine. So this seven milligrams per kilogram was invented in 1948, just shortly after the dinosaurs became extinct, when lidocaine was invented. So that's extremely safe. So if you stick with that, you don't need monitoring. You don't need anything. You just uh, need to have a nice day, do your surgery and go home. So here's another important tip. One quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 is extremely effective, both for local anesthesia and hemostasis up to three hours. And so you can dilute your 50 cc's that's safe with 150 of saline to get quarter percent with one in 400,000. Now you've got 200 milliliters of local that you can use. You can do anything with 200 milliliters of local. I'm going to show you. So the key to good local is dilute large volume amounts everywhere beyond where you're going to dissect. That's what tumescent means. It means you can see it and feel it wherever you're going to cut. And you want at least two centimeters beyond where you're going to cut. So here's my usual recipe. If I only need less than 50 milliliters, like, like a flexor tenon in the hand, for example, then I just use straight 1% lidocaine with adrenaline. If I need 50 to 100, like if I'm doing an elbow ulnar nerve release, I like 60 there. I add 50 cc's of saline to make half percent with one in 200,000. If I'm doing a smaller tendon transfer in the forearm, like, uh, I don't know, FDS4 to FPL, and I might need 100 to 150 cc's, then I'll add 100 mils of saline to make a third percent with one in 300,000. But if I'm doing a full forearm tendon transfer, then I want 100 to 200 mils. So I'll add 150 mils of saline to make a quarter percent with one in 400,000, which is very effective for up to three hours. And I can do most hand surgery in three hours and I'm not that fast. So here's another tip. I'm not a big fan of bupivacaine or ropivacaine, these long lasting uh, local anesthetics. The main reason is they're dangerous. Even ropivacaine has killed people because it binds the uh, SA to the AV node and stops the heart for a long time. You can rescue that with intralipid, but who wants to? So a plastic surgeon once killed a five-year-old doing an autoplasty because of a little blast of bupivacaine in the vein during surgery. It's a hell of a stupid way to go. 
Lidocaine, on the other hand, is a much safer drug, even with small IV blasts. Anesthesiologists and emergentologists in their literature give 100 milligrams of lidocaine slowly IV in multiple trauma patients. That's one fifth of 500 milligrams, the toxic dose, seven milligrams per kilogram uh, to decrease pain in, in multiple trauma patients. So I don't care if I get a little bit of lidocaine with adrenaline IV, little blasts. I mean, the half-life of epinephrine IV is 1.7 minutes. So you can do all your procedures in the time that lidocaine gives you. And here's the other annoying thing about bupivacaine. I've had it in my own fingers four times. You put this stuff in your own fingers if you think it's that great. It's not. The pain relief lasts a long time, yeah but the numbness to touch and pressure lasts more than twice as long. So that's why your patients come back to the emergency room and say, geez, my finger hurts doctor, but it's still numb. They're not crazy. And we've proven this with level one evidence in humans. So for these reasons, I'm out. You can use bupivacaine if you like, but really I want my patient to keep their hand up. I don't want them walking around with their hand dangling down 10 hours after surgery because they're still numb. I don't think that's smart, I really don't. So this is a cubital tunnel release. I like 60 milliliters, so I use half percent with one in 200,000. And you can see that's what tumescent means. It means it's swollen and ready to rock and you do that half an hour before the surgery, let them go pee, they come back, now the epinephrine's working. It takes epinephrine 26 minutes, level uh, one and two evidence in humans for maximal vasoconstriction. We used to think it was seven minutes. That was in a pig study from 1987. The other nice thing about this position is it's a great position to do the surgery in, uh, especially if you don't have all the airway stuff going on. And I close all these with buried 5-0 monochrome, the same as my carpal tunnels, no stitches to take out. It's a really good thing to do. Now, I want you to look at this, guys. He's comfortable. He says, my shoulder is comfortable up here, doc. Okay, bring it down now, because before surgery, you told me it hurt like hell when it was right there, right where we do general anesthesia. When I used to have patients say, what the hell did you do to my shoulder while well, you fixed my elbow, doc? They should be uh, comfortable. You know, people, you can do uh, ulnar nerves on their belly. You can do FPL on their belly. Uh, without all the tubes and IV stuff in the way, you can turn the patient whichever way they're comfortable on their side. Uh, this is uh, CY Chen from Taiwan. Uh, and he's an orthopedic surgeon who does hand surgery, but he also does uh, general orthopedics. And here he's going to plate a uh, fibula. It's an ankle fracture. And he's injected first under the skin, then uh, all on the periosteum and in the hematoma. And plus he's injected some on the other side. And now he's injecting in between the fibula and the tibia. <laughs> Patient's wiggling his toes, pain-free, and uh, there he is. And this is Amir Ahmad from Malaysia, first in the skin, then at the periosteum in the fibula, then walking the periosteum first proximally, then in the hematoma, then distally. So you go all around the periosteum when you do these. Uh, and then there's the plate. And then there's the patient uh, moving uh, at the end of the case. So people with bad lungs, uh, bad hearts, uh, this is a good thing to do. The BSSH and the British Ortho Association, as well as the Ortho Trauma Society, have recently released these documents where they've recommended that surgeons consider Wallant in these times of COVID. You know, the business of taking out endotracheal tubes and people spewing droplets all over the place if they have COVID, or 
just sitting up uh, and going home or getting on a stretcher and leaving, uh, you know, there's a huge difference. And also the number of people in your team, talk about social distancing. You know, if you got a normal team of a dozen people in the OR, or there's just me and my nurse doing carpal tunnels, uh, that's a huge difference. This is an elbow fracture by Amir Ahmad. Uh, and you're looking at the drawings on the left there. So blue is sub-Q, pink is periosteal. So the first thing he does is he blows it all up where the incision is going to be. And then he knows where he's going to do his dissection to uh, put the plates and maybe tension wire band, depending on what he does with the elbow. I don't do any of the surgery because I'm a plastic surgeon. So I don't do this uh, kind of stuff. But, you know, he puts it in and then he injects in the bone. Uh, and then, yeah, just a second, I just need to move this chat thing out of the way here. And then there's the patient at the end, um, moving his elbow and you can see the fixation, see how stable it is and so on. Uh, so Amir published the first distal radius uh, plate. And so again, first in the skin and now he's injecting on the bone. And, and if you look on the left, the first drawing you see, you can see how the needle first goes uh, radially and then uh, volarly and then dorsally and you're walking along the periosteum because you got to knock out all that periosteum and put your plate on so it doesn't hurt. And there are a number of people now, I know at least uh, four American surgeons who are plating distal radius fractures and, and uh, in Taiwan there's a good paper comparing general anesthesia to wall ant for distal radius plating and so here's another important tip. You don't want patients to think that you're a torturer. You want them to think that you're a magician. So I'm gonna show you how to aim for zero pain of injection of local anesthesia. And certainly you should always have zero pain at surgery. You should never have to top up local anesthesia or add more local anesthesia during the surgery. That should be a no-no just as much as waking up from a general anesthetic. Having said that, you should always plan your dilution, your volume, so that you always have extra. This is like flying an airplane. You know, you really always want to make sure you have enough gas to land. So always make sure you have extra local anesthesia in case you need it. Need it. Now, the very worst case scenario, you wrap up the wound in a, a, in a sterile saline gauze, take them to the operating room, put them to sleep, and do it. I've never had to do that in my entire life, but I could. I mean, that's, that's the worst plan. So there are 13 rules um, to not hurting people in 2020. And one of the more important ones is use the 27 or 30 gauge needle. I've quit using a 25. I know some of you even use 22s. Uh, please don't do that. If you use a smaller needle, it hurts less and it forces you to slow down and be patient. And all this has been written up in the book and in papers and videos and all of these things are available. I'm only going to focus on a few of these 13 rules. The first is that the 27 gauge needle is my go-to needle. My secret weapon down below here is a 3cc syringe and a short 30 gauge needle. I love those. That's what I do my digital blocks with. It's what I do my kids with. It's what I do people who are sensitive with. And it hurts less going in the skin. It forces me to slow down and be patient. So here's a tip. All of you work at institutions. Each one of those institutions has a person who orders needles. Go meet that person and show that ask that person to show you the order form where they tick off the box that says what kind of needle to order and show them the sizes that you want. You can't say, oh, we can't get that here. Of course you can. Somebody orders them, go find that person. 
We're gonna move down here to use sensory noise for needle insertion, because this is a really, really important tool. And this is, if, if you press and pinch the scanner, if they take a deep breath, it, the pain hurts less of the needle going in. And sometimes you can take it away completely. The important rule about the freezing is the don't move rule. If you pull back, then the needle comes out after stick it in two times. If you don't move, it hurts just one time, okay? So try not to move. And at the count of three, I'm gonna put the needle in. So don't move, okay? One, two, three. That's cool. I feel a little bit of stomach. This so guy was, sting he was really worried about it. I'm surprised. Compared to what I've been putting through, like with this. So you were uh, kind of petrified of the needle, right? Yeah, no idea. Right, because you hate needles, right? Can't stand. Right, how much did this one hurt? Out of like one to 10? Yeah. Uh, point two. Okay. Like point two, not even one. Okay, good. Like really zero. I barely even felt it. Good. So the key is to pinch that skin uh, while it goes in. Out of three, don't move, okay? One, two, three. Good. See, you push the skin the right into muscle. the needle. So at the count of three, just try not to move. You've already seen this one. What my dad says yeah. is always um, take a deep breath okay. and hold it for a little bit until okay. it doesn't hurt. That's a great idea. Yeah. So at the count of three, I'll tell you when to take a deep breath, okay? Okay, okay ready? Okay. One, two, take a deep breath right now. <gasps> oh, what a good girl you are. Oh, what a Good girl. It's almost finished hurting. Can you please tell me when it's not hurting at all anymore? It's not hurting anymore. Oh, beautiful. So at the count of three, try not to move. At the count of two, take a nice deep breath. Can you do that? Is that okay? Yep. Okay, good. One, deep breath. Don't move. Good. Keep the pinch on. Keep the noise going until the pain goes away. How sore was that? Okay, John, at the count of three, I'm gonna give a little poke, so try not to move, okay? At the count of two, I want you to take a deep breath. Can you do that for me? So one, two, three, good. At the count of three, try not to move. At the count of two, take a nice deep breath. One, deep breath, don't move. Thank you for not moving. Here, there's not enough skin to pinch. And so when there's not enough skin to pinch, you make sensory noise by pressing very firmly with your fingertip, just proximal to where the needle goes in. So I like 20 milliliters for my carpal tunnels, and I like to put uh, at least eight milliliters between the median and the ulnar nerve uh, underneath the volar forearm fascia. It's all about, it's better to have too much than not enough. If you do that, people never feel a thing. You can just go just on top of the carpal tunnel. You don't have to get a median nerve block, but at least 3% of your patients are going to feel a zing when you spread underneath the ligament before you cut. And so if you want them to have zero pain, and that's my goal, zero pain, then uh, get the nerve as well and give it at least a half an hour. So we're gonna go down to, when you're doing a large area, reinsert needles only in numb skin and always inject too much volume instead of not enough volume. And so I'm gonna put my first 10 cc's in there without moving anything at all. And then I'm gonna put in the next 10 cc's by starting at least one centimeter inside the white pink junction. So this is one centimeter inside the white pink junction. So I don't think he's gonna feel anything there. Did you feel that? No. That's good. So the whiter my hair gets, the less my needle moves.
just put 10 cc's right there. Don't move that needle forward. You don't have to. Where's it going to go? It's going to go everywhere. So you go from the radial side to the ulnar side to the radial side to the ulnar side because it gives it a little time to get numbed up. I probably put uh, 25 cc's in this, just blew the crap out of it. Nobody ever complained about being too numb, okay? I've never had a patient say, Dr. Lalonde, why have you put in so much local anesthesia? It doesn't happen. Down here, ask for patient feedback every time. If you don't ask people if they're feeling pain, you don't know. And what you want to do is just have them feel the first poke. That's called a hole in one. If they feel pain two times, it's an eagle. Three times, it's a birdie. Four times, go back to medical school. Right. So I'd like you to please score me while I put the freezing in. Because if I don't know what you're feeling, if I'm hurting you a lot, I don't know. And if I don't know, I can't get better. Yeah. So you're going to feel the first little poke probably when I put the freezing in. But after that, I want you to tell me when the first sting is gone. And every time after that, I want you to tell me if you feel any more pain. Because I don't know if you don't tell me. So you're going to feel this first little poke here. So at the count of three, I want you to try not to move. At the count of two, I want you to take a nice deep breath. Can you do that for me? So you're gonna pinch three times. One, deep breath, don't move, great. Thank you so much for not moving. So is that still stinging in there? Don't feel anything. You don't feel anything? No. Did it sting when the needle Just went a in? Little wee, a little wee bit. Okay, so here's what I, and right now it's not stinging. Okay, so can you please tell me if you feel any sting at all in the next 10 minutes. Right. So I'd like you to... So we published this paper eight years ago where 25 consecutive medical students were taught how to inject carpal tunnel so it doesn't hurt and 75% scored a hole in one, 25% scored an eagle. And the point is anybody can do this. And here's the tip. The most usual cause of painful anesthesia when I see learners start is injecting big volumes too fast, moving that bloody needle around like I used to do when I started for the first 20 years of my practice. But for the last 15, I have not done that. And the third is not injecting enough volume. And then finally, always inject from proximal to distal. That just kind of makes sense. All the nerves run from proximal to distal. So if you inject from distal to proximal, you keep hurting the nerves over and over again. So this fellow I did in Honduras, he cut eight finger flexors. And so what we're gonna do here is four FDS tenon grafts, but I start in the forearm and always inject from proximal to distal. So in his case, I injected about 110 mils of one quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000. You can dig out the A pulleys off of the bone. You don't need hunter rods anymore. I think they're obsolete. You can always dig the A2 out of the bone. And then we put four FDS primary tendon grafts underneath those A2 pulleys that we dug out of the bone. And we managed to keep his A4 pulleys. And there he was at the end of the case. Uh, and here he was at three and a half months uh, post-op doing, I did his therapy uh, through WhatsApp from Canada to Honduras. So here's another example of always inject from proximal to distal. This is FDS3, 70 milliliters of half percent lidocaine with one in 200,000. The local is accelerated 32 times. It actually took in 11 minutes to inject. And you just walk your way down and just blow it up. And obviously at the end, they feel a lot less. And so here he is actively flexing his FDS of the long finger, and there's his FPL tendon. Uh, and 
look at the excursion on that proximal stump. It's wonderful to examine the excursion when you're doing a tendon transfer. You always put two knots for the first temporary not very suture. Slowly and not forcefully, just flex your left arm. That just wasn't tight enough. So we took out the two knots and then we uh, made, yep. made it tighter. As best you can. I need to make sure you can straighten it all the way you can. Okay, great. I love that. And then bring it in. Cool. And straighten it out. And bring it in. Fantastic. Now that's much better. So setting the tension right is a lot easier when they're awake than when they're asleep, that's for sure. Here's another tip. If you're still hurting people when you inject local anesthesia, it took me 20 years of hurting people before I learned how not to. You're never too old to stop hurting people. This is a, a triple transfer pronator teres to ECRB, FCR to EDC, palmaris longus to extensor pollicis longus. And this is Amir Ahmad again from Malaysia. Uh, for pronator teres, you need to inject on the bone because you're going to be lifting up the periosteum there. All the rest of this is sub-Q. So this is for palmaris longus and FCR. And you're going to inject somewhere between 150 and 200 milliliters of quarter percent with one in 400,000 to do one of these. Now there's the skin incisions between uh, pronator teres and extensor carpi radialis brevis. And then here he is isolating EPL and EDC, isolating PL and FCR. PL and FCR in the proximal wound, PL to EPL, and there's pronator teres with the insertion on the bone going to ECRL. And here he is at the end of the case. He still hadn't done pronator teres to ECRL be at that point, but he went on and did that, and here's the patient at six months uh, post-op. Here's another tip, how to manage the adrenaline rush, because about a third of patients get an adrenaline rush. So you warn each and every patient, you may feel a little shaky like you've had too much coffee. If you do, it's temporary, it's normal, and it's going to go away all by itself in 15 or 20 minutes. And most important, you're not allergic to it. If you don't warn them about this, a small percentage of your patients are going to freak out. So I warn everybody every time about the adrenaline rush. And most people watch Hollywood movies, so they know what adrenaline means. The other problem is fainting. Fainting happens because there's not enough blood going to a patient's brain. So you avoid it by always injecting patients lying down. You recognize it because patients, even if they're lying down, if they're going to faint, they say, I'm not feeling very well, or I think I'm going to be sick, or they get pale between the eyes or they start to yawn. If those things happen, you need to get more blood to the brain. So the first thing I do is put my hand underneath their knees and lift up their knees and flex their hips. The two liters of blood in their thighs goes to the brain. I then take out the pillow, put it underneath the feet, more blood to the brain. I then go to the head of the bed and I put the bed in Trendelenburg. All this takes me about 15 seconds. Clearly, I've done it lots of times. You should get used to doing this because it's going to happen to you. And if you don't, patients are going to throw up and it looks like they have a seizure. Patients who are fainting look like they have a seizure. I'm sure you've seen that when you've taken a bandage off in your clinic or taken a cast off. And so this is the solution to avoid it. Then you can let the nurse go get the cold, wet face cloth, which does absolutely nothing for cerebral blood flow. 
but you've solved the problem. And then you keep them there for at least five minutes. If you sit them right back up, the same thing's gonna happen again. So the first row, you wanna look here. Yeah. Look here. yeah is that this hand is on strike for the next two or three days. It only does one thing. It stays up here just like that, okay? Yeah. So none of this, no walking around with your hand down, and yeah. none of this, because both those things cause bleeding inside the hand, and that turns to a clot, and then it takes your body longer to get better because it's got to dissolve the clot, mm -hmm. and that can take weeks. So if you, this hand is on strike, it stays up here just like that, uh, for the next two or three days until you're totally off painkillers and you know what hurts and only when you're off that dental Tylenol and you know what hurts can you let it down and start to do things okay okay yeah so instead of talking to nurses about the weather use your intraoperative time and use your injection of local anesthesia time because that doesn't hurt to teach patients this has decreased my complication rate more than anything else that I've ever done in all my years of practice. If you tell patients how to behave and you ask them what they're planning to do next week, you can abort all kinds of complications. Intraoperative education is key. That's probably the best tip I'm gonna give you today. Now, more than 90% of Canadian carpal tunnels are done like this, no hat, mask, gloves, four towels, just prep the part that you're gonna operate on. And we published a paper uh, nine years ago, 1,500 cases, six surgeons, five cities, only six patients got minor infections. Nobody needed incision and drainage. Nobody needed IV antibiotics. Nobody needed to go to the operating room for draining pus. Four patients responded to oral antibiotics, two got no antibiotics, just removal of sutures for a very safe 0.39 infection rate. And so there's a lot of evidence that we can move these procedures out of the operating room. There's evidence for K-wires with field sterility. That's just one of many papers. If you wanna see more papers on evidence-based sterility, this is the new way to go. Google evidence-based sterility with my name. It's an open access article and it's got all the papers in there um, referenced or at least up till that point. And here's the garbage. There's main operating room garbage for full sterility for a carpal tunnel. And all that stuff costs money and we pay for it. We are the government. We are paying insurance companies. It's our money. This is the same um, carpal tunnel garbage in a minor procedure room outside the main operating room. And there's no difference in infection outcomes, none. Think about that. And all that garbage is going into our oceans. So operating rooms are one of the greatest contributors of plastic in the oceans. And if we, the surgeons don't change this, who's gonna change this? Who? You tell me, it's gotta be us. So thank you. I'm going to stop there and we're going to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lalonde. That was amazing. Thank you for your tips and tricks in particular. We'll be able to take them forward. I'm sure as a lot of us are starting to use Wallant technique more and more, especially in these times. And our first question actually is from Mihaela, um, who asked quite a topical question. She says, do you have any advice regarding field sterility in a COVID suspected patient? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that because I, frankly, I'm hardly doing any surgery these days. Uh, but I think that it's still the droplet problem that's the main problem. You know, I think as, if the COVID patient has a mask on, their risk of giving you droplets are less. I'm sure they're going to give you fewer droplets uh, with Wallant than they would if they were asleep or spewing all over you. I don't have anything more intelligent than that to say about that. I see the next question, any other alternative to fentolamine? If that's okay with you, I'll answer that. Yeah, cool. So uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, I've tried terbutaline in my own hands, didn't work. Uh, I used lidocaine with adrenaline one finger, lidocaine with adrenaline the other finger. I was blinded because uh, terbutaline is supposed to you know, work. It doesn't work. 
I couldn't tell the difference between my saline finger and my tributylene finger. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's the only drug that I know of that works. And I've spent a lot of time looking into this. Lovely, thank you. We've had a few questions regarding the use of Wallington children. And in particular, what's the youngest patient you've used it in? Right. Um, well, the, the child you saw was four years old. Um, and there's a whole chapter in the book on how to do kids. But you can also do neonatals, you know, with nubbins, the little nubbin there. The best thing to do with neonatal nubbins is as soon as they're born as possible, you get the mom to bring the baby in. Uh, she feeds the baby uh, general anesthesia from food. Anybody who's got babies knows this. You know, after they've been sucking for 15 or 20 seconds, they're gone. And so that's when you take your 30 gauge needle, 3 cc syringe, pinch the skin, and put it in. And, and most babies will kind of. And that's it. And then after they're finished eating, now you have the world's best general anesthesia. They're sleeping. And so you, you do it uh, with the mother holding the baby with field sterility and you nip off the nub and burn the base. Um, there's a video on that in the book. I've done a flexor tendon in a seven year old. You know, it's not about the age, it's about the reasoning. If you can talk to them and they don't go squirrely in their eyes, you know, you say, look, do you think you can hold still for just a little sting and you talk to them all about the magic medicine? There's a whole bunch of things to say. I mean, it took me years to, you know, anyway, it's all, it's all there. If you read it, it's there. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Thomas Tikunas, who's a colleague in England and Wales. He asks, do you have any problems with tension on flexor repairs if the muscle belly is still active? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that one. So sometimes patients who are awake are going to pull back on you, right? And so if you want them to relax their flexors, ask them to extend the finger. There's a spinal cord reflex that forces the flexors to relax when they're actively extending. So you can passively flex the wrist, passively flex the MP joints, ask them to extend their fingers. And now the long flexors relax and you can pull them up. And the same goes for the extensors. If you want them to relax their extensors, ask them to flex. And so this will help you deliver the tendon. Once you deliver it, you skewer it with needles in the usual way and Bob's your uncle. Lovely. Um, a question from Nacle Kane, um, who asked a more practical question. Do you integrate the extra anesthetic time into your surgical day, particularly if you're operating as a single surgeon? During your yeah, you know, that's a... That's a great question. I can do uh, 15 to 20 small hand procedures in a day, just me and my nurse. And there's, again, a whole chapter on how to do that, how to do the timing and all that kind of stuff um, in the book. But the, uh, the way it works is I finish a case, I walk out, the nurse changes over the room while I go inject the fourth patient. So I inject patient one, two, three. While I'm injecting number three, she brings number one into the room, preps and drapes. I come in, do the surgery, close it up, educate the patient during the anesthesia, during the surgery, walk out. While she's bringing number two into the room, I go inject number four. My problem is I don't even have time to go to the bathroom. Like there's no downtime. You know, all this, you know, twiddling your thumb, waiting for the anesthetist in the room turnover, it ain't happening. And there's just me and one nurse. And we're doing like, we can do 15 carpal tunnels in a day. I do a lot of traveling. My wife is my nurse. And when I come home on Saturday, we'll knock off six or seven carpal tunnels on Saturday morning just to make money so that I can pay for my plane rides. You know. <laughs> Lovely. Um, there's a question from Hector Marsano who asks essentially about monitoring patients while having Wallant in the operating room. Right. We don't monitor, have not for 30 years. So here's the, you know, everybody wants to monitor in the operating room because they're worried about the toxic, the toxic effects of sedation. <laughs> You're, the reason you monitor is to protect yourself from sedation. 
If there's no sedation, there's no poisons to protect yourself from. And really one of the best things to say to your nurses is, when was the last time that you were monitored at your dentist? Did they take your blood pressure? Did they start an IV? And we're giving exactly the same drugs that they do at the dentist. More than 2 billion Americans have had lidocaine with adrenaline at the dentist since it was invented in 1948. If there was a real problem with no monitoring because of lidocaine with adrenaline at the dentist, every night you would hear lawyers commercials on TV, hurt by your dentist, call William McVentist. You know, it, it, it's just not happening. So lidocaine with adrenaline are probably the two safest drugs in the world. I think though, if you're gonna introduce sedation, sedation is like pregnancy. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're either sedated or you're not. If you're gonna sedate people, you know, in my view, I would use uh, monitoring. And not only that, I don't wanna do that in my office. I wanna do that in the hospital. And not only that, I wanna do that with my anesthesia colleagues. I don't wanna be responsible for sedation. That's not what I do, I'm a surgeon. Some surgeons like it, not me. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here about whether you use hyaluronidase at all to get a more rapid onset and spread of the vasoconstrictive effect. Uh, yeah, the answer is no. I don't use hyaluronidase to get a more rapid onset because it happens right away anyway. If you, if you put in big tumescent local anesthesia goes through the tissue so quickly that you don't need to break it down with an enzyme. And also hyaluronidase is a protein. And so some people after repeated injections can develop an allergy to it. So then you got to go, have you ever had it before and all this kind of stuff. So the answer is no, I don't. But I know that some uh, do. Uh, I, I, in my practice, I just don't think I need it. Thank you. And a few questions here along that same line about whether you use or when you use bicarbonate and how you uh, sort of the concentration that you use to mix this as well. Right. We did a study years ago where one of my residents actually did the chemistry of it with, with, with a pH meter. And what we found is 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000, the ideal concentration of 8.4% bicarbonate is 1 to 10. So 1 cc of bicarbonate, 10 cc's of local. But we never did the study for 1% with 1 in 200,000, which is what you have in Europe. So I would suggest if you have a medical student or a resident who's sitting on his thumbs and he's looking for something to do, he should measure how much bicarb it takes for one in 200,000 to get the pH to 7.4, because it may not be one to 10. It may be different. Thank you. We've got a question from Ricky Mystery, um, a colleague in London as well, who asks, if you're using large volumes of local anesthetic, do you ever have problems with clear fluid in the operating field, particularly if having to use the microscope or loop magnification? I always use loop magnification. Maybe it's because I'm getting old. <laughs> but, uh, and the answer is no. The, it does not uh, cause visibility problems. If anything, the large volume of water hydro dissects the tissue planes for you and really makes it quite easy to see things. And as soon as you make your incision, all that stuff comes out anyway. At the end of the case, you'll be amazed at how little swelling there is in the hand. It's almost all gone, especially if it's a longer case. Amazing, thank you. Just to note everyone, we've still got almost 60 questions coming in. So we're not gonna have time to answer all of them, unfortunately, but I'm just trying to answer as many as possible. Um, there's a slightly specific question here from Constantin Bergmeister who asks if you have experience with dorsal wrist ganglions, uh, ganglions sorry. Um, mainly because they've tried several times and they experience some pain when coming to the scapholunate ligament. Yeah, you got to inject down into the joint and into the ligaments if you're going to do that kind of stuff. Uh, frankly, I don't operate on much on ganglions anymore. Uh, I think that it's more of a cosmetic operation for most people. Uh, and also a lot of them go away if you do nothing. So I'm a kind of a big fan of conservative management, but I have done can do, and you do need to inject in the ligament and at least some in the joint, otherwise it's gonna hurt. Thank you. Um, 
a slightly more practical question here from Ahmed Gad, who asks, how do you overcome if patients get bored and need to move around and change position during long cases? No problem. I encourage it. I want them to move around. I don't want them to get a pressure sore. And in fact, you know, some people come in and they got a sore shoulder and, and I say to them, okay, look, are you more comfortable on your side? Or if I see they're starting to squirm, I say, would you like to move around? Because it doesn't matter to me one bit whether they're on their side or, you know, I, I can move their arm all over the place. If you don't have a tourniquet, if you don't have uh, all that airway stuff, and especially if you're unencumbered with all of that unnecessary draping for a lot of the cases that we do, people can move around and be comfortable and they should be. Lovely, thank you. Uh, for long, oh, may, may I just interject? For long cases, like uh, forearm tendon transfers that are gonna take a couple of hours because I'm not that fast, I want them to go pee first. So, and of course, no IVs ever, you know, so, uh, you put the local in, they go pee, they come back, you prep and drape and you do your surgery. I encourage all my patients to go pee anyway, especially the older men. I sympathize with that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're having a few questions asked about tendon repairs and fractures. That's going to be a topic that Dr. Lalong covers this time next week. So I'll save some of those questions for that time if that's okay. Um, yeah. And just a couple of other questions other questions coming in here. Um, lots about children. Um, a few questions about whether you are happy to use it when performing local flaps um, in the hand, for example. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Teddy Prasetyono uh, in Indonesia and Dr. Jing in China have both written extensively about this. They do a lot of local flaps uh, with uh, lidocaine, with epinephrine. It's a little tougher. Uh, I don't, I don't do a lot of flaps anyway. I'm a big secondary healing fan. I'm a very simple guy, you know, I don't do complicated stuff very much. But it, it, the flaps do look pale and it is hard to tell how much they're bleeding uh, because of the epinephrine. And I suppose you could inject fentolamine around the base of the flap. It doesn't seem to kill the vessels though, even though they're really, really tiny vessels. You know, the whole business of epinephrine killing stuff is probably not true. Oh, this is one thing that's worth mentioning. Patients, one thing that they will do, the most common cause of finger loss after local anesthesia is patients burning their own fingers. Uh, Keith Denkler reported 14 cases of this. So if you've ever had, especially bupivacaine in your own finger and it takes 30 hours for it to come back, you almost want to dick it in hot water to get your feeling back. It's really annoying. And patients do that. And some of them, and I know for a fact, because uh, I've actually met some cases where people stuck their hand in boiling water, stuck their finger in, and you can see the burn. I mean, it's got a watermark. The blister has a watermark. So it, you have to pay attention to that. You know, uh, when people come in and they got blisters after local anesthesia, Ask them gently, you know, it's like, you know, did you try to get the feeling back by putting your finger in warm water? You know, you, you got to do it nicely. But it is the most common cause of loss after local anesthesia is self-burning, trying to get the feeling back. Nice, thank you. Um, another question asking about if patients have ever been non-responsive to local anesthetics, such as those with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and if you have any advice for... For that in particular? Wow, I don't think I have knowingly injected somebody with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so I can't answer that question. Non-responsive to local anesthesia, I don't believe. I don't believe that somebody is not responsive to a lidocaine. Oh, I can't be numb with lidocaine, no. I've met lots of people who are convinced that they can't be numb with lidocaine. But if you blow it up, put in big volume, they're very numb. So it may exist. I still haven't met those people. Lovely, thank you. I think we'll ask this as a last question. Um, we're getting a few repeated questions. Um, do you have you used um, lo uh, local anesthetic and adrenaline for cases of burns in the hand? Um, and how would you um, advise us to infiltrate around the burn or into the burn? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Certainly secondary burn reconstruction, yes. No problem there. Acute burns, uh, you know, I, I have not, I don't have a lot of experience. I've cut out wounds with lidocaine and with adrenaline and closed them. Uh, I have cut out small burn wounds and closed those. Uh, and you just numb those up the same way that you normally would. I guess if you can get the local in the fat underneath the burn, you can do pretty much anything you'd like. Um, I'm trying to think of the downside. I'm not a big tangential excision fan. Uh, I am a full thickness burn excision fan. Um, so I, I guess I really don't know. I don't have enough experience to answer your question now. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, we're having a lot of comments in saying thank you very much for a great talk and asking for recordings, which um, Mr. Harris Pali will discuss in a second, I'm sure. And and I think with that, I'll pass back to Mr. Harris Palu um, for some further comments. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. Well, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Don, for a fantastic lecture, educative and, and, and inspiring. Uh, I'm just going to make a comment about one of the things. Somebody asked about highlights. And I've, I've, I've been trying many years not to hurt people. And um, I used to went through a phase of using, using highlights. And then I did the carpal tunnel where the lady had a bad anaphylactic shock. She went to ITU for two days. She went to the ward, was assessed by the occupational therapist who decided her house was not safe and I spent the next 35 days on my ward. I had to see her every week for about seven weeks. That was the last time I used high lace, you know. Right. I wanted to do one thing. I wanted to do a poll just before people leave. Um, and uh, you'll see it now. And what I want you to do is vote um, which one of these is the best option for you. I'll give you a few seconds. Uh, just just while, you're, while you're waiting for that, uh, next week, same time, same place, and we're talking about tendon surgery and fractures, how to get better results. And it's not just about wallet. Uh, there's going to be general principles uh, of how to not get stiffness and how to get better results. Less tenolysis, less rupture. We're going to talk about flexors. Uh, we're going to talk about fractures. It's going to be good. Uh, I've, I've put the link for next week on the chat. So if you click your chat, you'll, you'll, you'll see it there. Yeah. Uh, and I just uh, wanted to thank Dimitris for helping chair this, um, BSSH and BAPRAS for their support and be first for, for helping us. Also our friends from BOTA that have, that's the British Orthopedic Training Association that distributed um, the, the pamphlet for us. Thank you, all of you, for attending tonight. Uh, it's a very strange situation we're in. Please take care, look after yourself, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.